everybody. This is the Coffee with a Geek program. It is my first interview of 2023. January just flew by. We're into February and I've blurred my background, but if you could see out the window, you'd see snow here in Western New York. I don't know if you have it in New Hampshire where you are. With me today is uh, a different guest in a sense of the technology we're going to talk about today, but my guest is Therese Wilcom. Therese, thank you for joining me. Uh, Therese is the director of New Hampshire State Assistive Technology Program with the Institute on Disability at the University of New Hampshire. I love New Hampshire. It's where my wife and I went on our honeymoon, so it's a special place for us. And you are also a clinical associate professor and emeritus in the Department of Occupational Therapy. So a wonderful field uh, that does affects people's lives every day. So it must be a rewarding uh, field for you to be in. You're also known nationally and internationally as the MacGyver of assistive technology. And uh, is MacGyver getting outdated? I don't know. I hope not. <laughs> it's, it was a great show. Um, and uh, so, and you've designed, again, this is going from your biography kind of, uh, and fabricated thousands of solutions for individuals with disabilities. You have a book that we're going to talk about, I hope, in some detail, which is called Make Stuff and Love People, which uh, really kind of brings an emotional heart string. I think it's, again, a beautiful title and, uh, again, highlights the work that you do. And it's really about assistive technology solutions in minutes. And um, it says book three. Is it book three? Yes. Oh my gosh! So you, we could talk about two other <laughs> two other of your books. Um, and, and really, let's kind of just dig into that. But let me just start first of all with welcoming me. Thank you for being with me today. And let's start with what I usually do with most of my guests to introduce yourself and really talk about what's your educational journey. So how, how did all this start and begin and what, what were the passions and interests that brought you here? So, uh, Well, thank you. Thank you for having me on your podcast. Um, so my journey, I grew up uh, farming in Wisconsin, one of 10 kids, uh, five girls and five boys. Wow. And yeah, big family. <laughs> And when um, you come from a big family, you know, you're working on the farm and you learn two real important lessons on the farm, and that is time and money. And time is a sense of urgency. Um, it's harvest time. The weather front's coming in. You got to get the crops out or there's a leak on the gas tank on the tractor. You got to fix that leak. Money was always related to uh, don't throw that away. You never know when you might need that. And I loved working with my father in the machine shop and building things and making things. And um, I was really interested in, I wanted to pursue um, a program in um, assistive technology. And at that time it was all called rehab engineering. Um, but the problem with rehab engineering is that it's, uh, you know, it was all like biomedical devices and biomedical engineering. And I was not interested in designing any new heart valve or any prosthetic devices. Um, I was really inspired by a gentleman I met by the name of Kali Malik, and he was out of George Washington University. And he um, looked at taking just everyday items. Back then, it was like garage door openers and turning them into um, automated um, remote devices for people with disabilities. And it was it was really fascinating. And the, but at the time, the only thing I found that was interesting was vocational rehabilitation because it was helping people with disabilities get back to work. And so I pursued that uh, degree at the University of Wisconsin Stout. And then I got a second degree in special education and that part of really looking at transition and employment and modifying worksite opportunities for students with disabilities. And um, one of the things about student teaching, I think people should do student teaching their freshman year, not their last year, to really understand what it's like to be a teacher day in and day out and just some of the challenges. Um, for me personally, growing up in Wisconsin, three of us in the family were diagnosed with learning disabilities. And in addition to the learning disabilities, so I'm, I'm one, 
And mine are vertical reversals, like P's and B's and W's and um, really flipping things um, around and seeing the world upside down and inside out. And and that has really been a gift because a lot of my inventions and creations have all been um, by seeing things upside down. And, and like you take a plate and you turn it upside down and you can turn it into 25 different assistive technology solutions or even tools. Um, you take some of the tools and turn them upside down. And and um, and when I say tools, I'm talking about a PVC cutter, um, uh, a wire stripper, things that I've adapted for students with disabilities, um, students with cerebral palsy to be able to use these different tools with limited grasping ability. Um, but I really struggled in school. Oh, and also diagnosed with Tourette's. And so I just remember being pulled out of the classroom, being put into a segregated classroom and uh, just the challenges at the time with all that reading and writing. And I remember I scored really, really badly on um, the uh, SAT um, tests. So I was not recommended to go to college. So I got a job at a factory and assembling at the factory. And I was also working as a waitress. And of course, there was always the farm um, activities. And then I tell the journey about um, my English teacher, Mrs. Larson, after I graduated um, from high school, she said, you know, you could go to college. And I go, oh, no, I can't go to college. You got to be able to read and write to go to college. And I can't do all that reading and writing. And I make all those noises. And uh, um, she advocated for me and she said that that they had services for students with disabilities at universities and that I could get all my books on tape. I could take all my tests orally. And so she was very influential in um, me going to college and getting accommodations. And that was my first introduction to assistive technology, because one of the coolest things uh, back then was the Arkenstone scanner. And you'd put a piece of paper on and it would scan the paper and it would read it out loud. And I did have all my books on tape, which was really cool and developed some really interesting techniques because um, when you have books on tape, if uh, you put those cassettes in and you wanna go to page 25, you push the fast forward and you listen for the beeps and you count 25 beeps at that time. And that's how you get to page 25 on those cassettes. Well, I figured out a way that, you know, you, you go to these lectures, how do you possibly listen to a lecture? And then, you know, you can't take notes fast enough. It's really hard. And if you record it, there's only so many hours in a day. You don't have time to go back and listen to that hour tape again. So I would take a pen and um, in the lecture, anytime there was a concept that I didn't know or I couldn't get the notes on or I just needed to hear it again, I would tap twice next to the microphone on the, the cassette recorder. Then I take those cassettes and I'd put them in the machine and I put on fast forward and I would listen for a double tap. Did it, did it. And I would stop and just listen to that part of the lecture. And that was like really awesome. And then the other technique I figured out was because I had books on tape and what was awesome is all those words were all being decoded in front of me. I would listen going, oh, what the five areas of the brain, the occipital lobe, the frontal lobe, and they were all pronounced, right? So I'd stop the play and I'd pick up my, record, my recorder and I would say, the five areas of the brain are the occipital lobe, the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe. Then... I would be like eating cornflakes for breakfast in the morning and I would play my notes, that whole reauditorization. The bottom line was I graduated with straight A's, summa cum laude, all because of the assistive technology. And so my first job, I was working with an occupational therapist. We were working with um, a lot of farmers in northern Wisconsin. And I became really intrigued. I wanted to go back and get my master's degree in rehab engineering. I wanted to work more on modifying agriculture, livestock handling facilities, um, uh, creating tools for arm amputations, making adaptations for leg amputations. And uh, so a gentleman came up uh, from Drake University and said, if you come to Drake, we'll let you do all your field work and your internship in rehab engineering. And I got to spend my time with four different rehab engineers who are absolutely amazing. 
And I discovered that all of these rehab engineers that do worksite adaptations for people with disabilities, it's like art. You know, you have people that specialize in oils or watercolors or clay or sculpture. So one engineer specialized in, he really loved doing everything with a hot glue gun and naga hide and, and, and plywood. Another one liked doing everything with um, aircraft aluminum and building. And so I was just like really fascinating. And, you know, I just discovered things along the way. So I ended up in Iowa um, with the Farm Family Rehabilitation Management Program. And I ended up getting $50,000 grant from Senator Bob Dole, the Dole Foundation, to fund a mobile machine shop on wheels, a rehab engineering unit on wheels that I could travel around the whole state of Iowa and make assistive technology, modify agriculture work sites, all of that. And then what happened was um, a lot of the farmers with disabilities were developing secondary injuries, like um, overuse of a, a limb because they're now trying to farm with one arm or um, the hydraulics or the, the um, tractor lift breaking or the steps. or And so I wanted to go back to school and get my PhD in rehabilitation um, engineering. And at the time, it was called Rehabilitation um, Science and Technology that I got my PhD in. And then um, I got a job as the director of New Hampshire Statewide Assistive Technology Program. And they told me they wanted me to work with students in schools. And I'm like, students in schools <laughs> after working doing all of this you know welding i took uh, three courses in welding uh, motor mechanics uh, building uh, construction uh, i can take an engine apart put it back together I, it was just like i just absolutely loved all of that hands-on and then they said uh we have all these students that need assistive technology and uh, and then they had early intervention, and those are the the zero to three year olds. I was like, they're little. <laughs> so something magical happened, and that was at Pembroke Acad Academy. Um, as the executive director of ATEC Services, we had this bizarre situation where all of our OTs and speech and language pathologists and the physical therapists. Um, they were all out. They were on medical leave. And this teacher called up. It was like a case manager at Pembroke Academy said, we've got eight students who are on um, the list for getting an assistive technology evaluation. They need all this assistive technology. We made the referral way back in August. It's now March. And these students did not receive anything, no evaluation, nothing. And I was like totally shocked. So what I went, I went to the front desk and I said, we're closing our doors today. We're loading up our cars with everything we have. And we're driving over to Pembroke Academy. And, and when I say we, it was just the office support staff and myself. No OTs, no PTs, no SLPs. We went over to Pembroke Academy. We rolled out um, into, we said, where are those seven kids? We're going to do something. And uh, by the end of the day, we made like 36 different devices. And what you have to understand about assistive technology is that it has a very high failure rate. Um, that I would say about 95% of the time, the first idea that you come up with and you try is not going to work, or it might, it might have to be tweaked or changed or modified. And um, I had the students here, pull that piece of tape off here. I need you to cut that at four inches. And we, we engaged everybody. We had the teachers and the students. And then if it didn't work, this whole five minute approach, because I don't believe in using glue, uh, nails, screws, power tools. We can build all of these with 10 different specialty tapes and reusable, um, readjustable plastics. I call it the ABLE principles, um, adjustable, collapsible, expandable, um, reusable, repositionable, uh, because if AT is not going to work or your first idea doesn't work, if you can quickly in five minutes, make it shorter, make it longer, make it, you know, try it over and over until you get it right. And then once the devices worked, I went and took a picture of all the students interacting with it. And so we were rolling out at the end of the day, exhausted, but really excited. And the principal said, are you going to send me a report for all those students? And I said, I'm going to send you pictures of them actually using the assistive technology devices um, that we created. 
Then the next day, another magical thing happened was the Gibney Family Foundation showed up at my office. Now, all, for like 20 years, they've been given um, ATEC services money, $500 a year to buy beeper balls for students who are blind. And uh, so they're they're at the they're at the door at the front door and uh i grab a beeper ball and i'm like oh come in thank you so much for funding these beeper balls they've been so great for our students and they said can can we sit down and, and visit with you a little bit and i said sure so i brought them back to my office and we sat down and um i remember the the gentleman uh from the gibney foundation put a piece of white paper in front of me and it had nothing on it and he slid it over and he said um i want you to inspire me but more importantly i want you to inspire my grandchildren and i said okay he said if you could do anything what would what would you do you know if you if we could give you a grant and they were like more than you know this whole five hundred dollars and the day before I was at Pembroke Academy and I had told them the story about what happened and about empowering teams and empowering teachers and really wanting to create um, a how-to book of ideas. So that was my book one. And um, I in in so so I came up with this idea on how to leverage money. So if the Gibney family could give me fifty thousand. I could multiply it by tenfold because I could get other matching monies um, to produce the, the book and then sell the book. And so that's that whole thing of selling it because there's certain technologies I can't make. I can't make an iPad. I can't make an app. So there's like electronic devices that we're so used to when we say technology. So 100% of the proceeds from this book on assistive technology solutions in minutes went into a pot that could only be used, 100% could only be used to purchase assistive technology um, for students with disabilities. And it was a great success. It was really, we, we raised over a quarter million dollars to buy um, assistive technologies and it was absolutely wonderful. So then I wrote book two. So book two, I wanted um, all these how-to videos, right? To go along with book two on creating solutions in minutes. And so I took all these how-to videos and I put them on a DVD. And then I put the DVD in the back of the book. And so you'd page through and go, oh, I think I want to make this solution for this student. It might be um, an iPad holder or a reading device, whatever. So, but what happened was, is that as time went on, people didn't have a DVD player, right, in their computers. And they had to stop what they're doing. They had to go find a computer. They had to pop it in. Then they had to search to find that video. Then they had to watch the video and then figure out, you know, how that they were going to make that. It just really wasn't very efficient. So then what happened was the advent of the QR codes. QR codes can point you in so many directions. You can, you can have access to tons of information to tons of videos instantly with a smartphone, right? You take your smartphone, scan a QR code, bam, you watch the video, bam, you do the document. So that happened, but something else happened was um, I've dedicated my life to five minutes, um, $5 or less, five minutes or less to really just demystify, to make everyone realize we're all responsible for creating solutions and we're all creative problem solvers. You don't have to be an OT or an engineer or an SLP. We all need to work together and figure this out. So I've been doing these workshops and I'll never forget because um, this one person said, but no, Dr. Wilkham, you can't, you can't do that for $5 or less or five minutes or less. I said, sure, because here's how much I paid for it and then cutting it and this is how I get it at that $5. And they made a really important point. They said, um, no, because if I go to Home Depot um, and I have to go up and down the aisles, they're not going to sell me two inches of tape. They're going to sell me um, a roll of tape. They're not going to um, sell me uh, four inches of acrylic. They're going to sell me a two foot by three foot sheet of acrylic. And before I know it, I got $100 worth of materials and I'm only going to use a tiny bit of that material. 
And then the other thing is I've wasted a whole day driving around to get it. Oh, and by the way, I would have to get a purchase order from my school to be able to get that and all the paperwork and the time to do that. Then I would have to bring it and cut it all up and then I could make it. And I was like, wow, you're right. You're right. Well, we got to do something about that. So um, one day I was having breakfast and you get this junk mail, right? And you're going through this junk mail and there was this flyer um, called Blue Apron and there's Blue Apron, there's Hello Fresh. And what's interesting is that you, you open it up and it says, you know, you, you want a meal <clears throat> and they send you a box and it might have one chicken breast, one carrot, one, you know, onion and a recipe and you cut it all up for that one meal. And all of a sudden I was like, oh my gosh, this changes everything. We're going to apply the Blue Apron approach to assistive technology in schools. Um, teachers are so busy, they're so overwhelmed, they've got so much paperwork. Um, we need to get it down to five minutes. And um, it, we don't want the teachers having to spend time filling out purchase orders and having to go around here, or there in terms of buying stuff. So I approached the um, Christopher Reeve Foundation and I got a grant for $75,000 to buy all of these fabrication materials and tools. And um, I've made now over, I've invented over 2000 different uh, devices. So I do these workshops and I empower teachers on how they can be makers, how they can be assistive technology makers. And they learn, how do you use a Cora Claw with recycled election signs? Um, how do you use Lockliff Rucker Tape and the 63 solutions you can make out of Lockliff Rucker Tape or Cat Tongue Tape or Lockline? Then I tell them, um, all right, with the book. So let's say you're like, oh, I have a student who could really use that mount for their iPad um, on their desk because they're always throwing that iPad. They All they have to do is say page um, 38 in the book. They can send me a text saying, I want to make 38. And so I grab the stuff off the shelves in a box. The QR codes are already in the book. There's over 500 QR codes. Then that box gets shipped to that teacher or to the paraprofessional or to wh whoever gets shipped to. They open up the box, scan the QR code, and then they start assembling it. They can make it shorter. They can make it longer. Um, they can position it wherever. So that year, we made over 2,000 different assistive technology devices. The outcome was amazing because people had no problem spending five minutes making something or adapting something when they didn't have to pay one penny for the materials, right? They didn't have to spend their time running around trying to find all the tools and materials. So we saved them time and money um, to be able to become instant, you know, problem solvers. And so now what's happening at these schools is this whole assistive technology makers movement has totally exploded. Um, I just got back from Florida at the ATIA conference, which is the largest assistive technology conference in the U.S., um, we had for the last three, four years, it's called um, AT Maker Day, Assistive Technology Maker Day. And it's the last day of the conference. It's open. It's free to everyone. And they and we attracted 26 assistive technology makers. And everybody had their tables. And you could go from one table to the next table. And you could make, you could make a ton of different devices that you could just take home with you and use it with somebody that you're working with. Well, high schools and techs, you know, the, the, the tech ed programs, a lot of them have 3D printers. And so in my book, I have um, also some 3D files that you can scan and down, download those 3D files on your own computer. And if your school has a 3D printer, you can print out the devices yourself. And we found that the, the tech ed of even doing joint um, projects of working side by side with students with disabilities, making um, reading solutions and writing solutions and um, schools, after school programming, setting up uh, maker spaces at schools. This, But the thing about the makers movement is 
we saw a lot of maker spaces being set up at your public library, at old warehouses. Um, and then COVID hit, right? And when COVID hit, you know, those spaces, everything was kind of shut down, but all these students still needed assistive technology. And the problem with maker spaces is, is that you have to load up all your tools, materials, you got to put them in your car, you got to drive to the space and the space, you know, might have only been open from like 6 to 8 p.m. on Thursdays. And so you have to fit it within that. And then, yes, you learn how to use, you know, the table saw or the drill press or the 3D printer. Then you got to clean everything up. You got to pack it all up. You got to get in your car. You got to go back home. You got to unload it. And I discovered with COVID that um, a maker space is anywhere. The maker space could be the trunk of your car. It could be your driveway. It could be your backyard. It could be your bathroom. It could be your kitchen counter, dining room table, the basement, the living room. And for our family, all of the above, every space in our house became a maker space. And we were making so many assistive technologies. And the other cool thing that happened was um, click and ship. We discovered click and ship. So click and ship is through the U.S. Postal Service. And uh, you just you fill out online and you put the door, you put your the box and give you all the shipping supplies for free. You get all the boxes, you put it outside your door. And when they deliver the mail, they take the boxes and ship it. And it's a flat rate box. And it was so awesome. I believe we served more students, more students got more AT during COVID than any other time because it, what it used to happen is um, people used to come to our office and they would used to pick up the technologies, the assistive technology devices, and then they would take it back to the student. And then when they were done with it, they would bring it back to our office. Um, but with click and ship, nobody has to get in a car and drive to pick something up. So we had to change our budget and beef up our shipping, but um, click and ship was really a cost-effective way of saving time and money and getting stuff to people that need it um, very quickly. So, you know, the, the, the trends of, of what's happening, the, the makers, oh, here's the other thing that's happening is every year, oh my gosh, there's new advances in the field of material sciences, new adhesives. So for example, one of the newest adhesives is this cat tongue tape. It was invented by a woman owned business is what it says on the, the packaging. And it looks like, you know, a cat's tongue. It's kind of, but it's really a, 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 a grippy material. It's like a rubber material and it's got a self-adhesive tape. And so I make these things that like can hold papers in place or can hold objects onto a student's lap. Maybe they're pushing with a wheelchair. Um, I make um, lap boards and slant boards and all of these things in this cat tongue tape. And what makes it really special was before I would use like some other rubber grippy stuff, but what if the child sneezed or drooled, right? You know, you get it back, you'd like, well, you'd have to like throw it out, right? Cat tongue tape, um, and nano tape is another one. You can take Dawn dishwashing soap and, and the power wash that came out within the last couple of years. Oh my gosh, you spray stuff down, run it under hot water, let it dry, it's good as new. And this whole thing about you need to be able to sanitize everything if people are going to reuse it. And so, you know, in the last five years, those new adhesives, those new ways of washing things and sanitizing and... Um, there's been you know, a lot of changes on that. And so that's exciting. The other is the explosion of corrugated plastic. Um, it used to be every four years after the presidential elections, we would get tons and tons of corrugated plastic signs, reused election signs. We'd wash them all up. And I've invented now 168 different assistive technology solutions out of recycled election signs. Well, now um, elections, really, you've got your, your Senate races every two years. So what's happening is we're getting these signs every two years and tons of it. And so the cool thing is um, we do all these like maker workshops. So we make up all these kits ahead of time 
and we're going to be at Closing the Gap this year. Um, we'll be at the Arthur Grapposis Conference, the Speech and Hearing Conference. And again, everything's designed five minutes or less. And actually, you know, there's these TikTok videos, right, that are like a minute. So this whole thing of a TikTok, 18 a minute, what could you do in 60 seconds or less? What could you fabricate in 60 seconds or less um, for students with disabilities? And so we've been doing a lot, like make it in a minute kind of thing. And so it's just, you know, that whole discovering, you know, that whole joy. And so book three, Make Stuff and Love People, is all based upon that five minute approach and um, instant, instant access. People don't have time to go find their computer and try to search for something on their computer. And the reason I didn't, people said, oh, you should do an app. Yeah, you should do an app. You should do, a, oh, it should be an ebook. Make an ebook. I was, no, it's a hard copy book that has 1500 images in it. And the reason is people don't know what they don't know. And so you like the first chapter really introduces you to all the different specialty tapes. It introduces you to Instamorph and the specialty plastics and corrugated plastic. And it teaches you the skills on how do you work with these things um, and how do you repurpose everyday items and use them in innovative ways. Then the other chat, oh, and then there's QR codes that take you to um, where video is important. Um, showing you how do you score and how do you snap. Um, so there's, and you can scan it. Uh, okay, so there's that. But more importantly than after you get through chapter one is that's when you dive into making solutions for reading, making solutions for writing, making solutions for grasping and holding, making solutions for employment and transition, making solutions for communicating, um, solutions for blind and low vision, for mobility impairments, um, iPad and iPhone mounting solutions, recreation and play solutions, um, life skills and self-care solutions. So you dive into that. And then chapter 12, which is really cool, is people get inspired going, oh, I didn't think about that. Oh, I didn't think about that. And they turn the page and then they're like, yeah, but where do you get cat tongue tape? Where, where do you get that lock lift rug gripper? To, you know, chapter 12 has all of the materials that I'm talking about with a picture and a QR code. So you can scan the QR code and it takes you right to that website of where you can, can find that. Um, the other advances has been washable tape. Now, why would anybody wash tape? You know, we're so used to, we know scotch tape. We're, you know, we put a piece of scotch tape on that. Well, scotch tape, um, that, you know, that is an awful tape because you can't get it off. So removable tapes and repositionable tapes and silicone tapes. So washable tapes, you can have one piece of tape and you can use it for six years. You just wash it in soap and water like a Dawn dishwashing soap that acts as a degreaser and dry it. And here's what's really kind of funny. So I've got these, there's these new like silicone pads and anything that's silicone lasts a long time and is also really grippy. So I washed one of these pads just to get the grime off, right? And the silicone and the nano tape is washable as well. And so I'm like, yeah, but it's what? And I want to use it right away with this student. How do I dry this? And so I just took a towel, right? A cloth towel and uh, push, squeeze down the two, it dried instantly. I thought, oh no, the lint and all that's gonna stick to the tape. It didn't. And all the stickiness returned and I could use it right then to stabilize something on the desk. And it just makes me grin ear to ear on the magic, the magic of, of assistive technology, the magic of these materials to be able to quickly problem solve um, on the fly, whip things out. Oh, let's try that. Then do you remember um, ever eating bazooka bubble gum? Of course. Yeah. All right. Grew so in the eighties. <laughs> all right. So, so bazooka, a little piece of bazooka bubble gum was about an <clears throat> inch by inch. And it was about, well, about that thick and you'd unwrap it. And there'd be like a cartoon, a waxy cartoon <laughs> yeah. in there. Well, I remember my dad saying, always carry some gum with you because you never know when you need to fix something, you know, always carry some book gum. And um, I was amazed at the wrapper because it was a waxy material. And I was like, oh, that that must be so that, 
the gum doesn't stick to the paper, right? So that you can peel it off. Now that's interesting. So there's like things that are coated that self-adhesive doesn't stick to. So I started looking at what are things that we throw away every day that are coated in this surface things don't stick to, like contact paper, right? Contact paper, you peel that off and you just throw that other stuff. Velcro, um, the peel and stick, the self-adhesive Velcro, you use the Velcro and you throw that away. And bumper stickers, you throw that away. Or foamy, this craft paper, you peel that foamy off from Michael's and you put it on things and you throw that backing away. Well, I started saving all of those backings because they're specially coated. And I made, there's a product that's called U-Glue and it's got a thousand and one uses. It's, a, it's an amazing product. Um, it's a double-sided, very strong tape, but you peel it parallel to the surface and it comes right off and leaves no residue behind and you can reuse it on a bunch of things. So I created what I call my Bazooka MacGyver <laughs> kit, my Bazooka Bubblegum kit. Love it. So it's got eight, anyways, it's got eight one inch pieces and it's rolled up. You know how like jewelers roll up their tools. Well, this is rolled up into the size of a piece of bazooka bubble gum and you unfold it, unwrap it. And you have eight individual pieces of U-glue because you never know when you need to fix something or have that. And you should have that in your wallet at all times. So that if you need to be a MacGyver on the fly, you can pull out your bazooka kit Pick off a piece of U glue and fix whatever whatever you need. Um, so, so then the other thing I did was um, so the bazooka the bazooka bubblegum kit. Um, well, it's not bubblegum, but it's, I just call it the bazooka kit. So then, taking those other seven or ten, nine, nine the other nine specialty tapes, and. Um, Velcro has, they've got wider pieces of Velcro things. So I've been making up tape cards on one side of the tape card is the double-sided removable adhesives. And then on the other side of the tape card are the double-sided permanent adhesives. So depending upon what situation you're in, you pick whatever specialty tape that you need to fix the particular problem. This way, you don't have teachers or service providers hauling around big rolls of tape, right? You've got your, your MacGyver tape kit that you have with you at all times. And I, you know, sprinkle them around. Like I'll have some in my backpack, some in my drawer, some in the closet, some in the glove box, in the car, you know, that's all kind of sprinkled around. And then I, I tell every teacher that they need to have one roll of lock lift rug ripper tape because of the hundreds of things that you can do with that. It's like a beeswax material, which then got me started with beeswax. Huh? Honey, did you know that <laughs> pressure sensitive adhesives? So I got really fascinated. 3M makes all these pressure sensitive adhesives and it's like a double-sided foam tape, double-sided VHB tape. Anyways, pressure sensitive adhesives require 15 pounds of pressure for five seconds. So you have to hold it down for like five seconds and it takes about 48 hours for it to really achieve its you know full strength. And so I started digging into pressure sensitive adhesive and found out that the very first pressure sensitive adhesive was honey. If you take a drop of honey and you put it between two smooth surfaces and you squeeze it down and you hold it there for five seconds, you cannot pull it apart. It is incredibly strong. You cannot pull it apart. Now you can slide it apart, but you cannot pull it apart. So honey was used as the very first pressure sensitive adhesive. So I thought that was cool. Then I started looking at the honeycomb itself, right? And it turns out that the New York subway was all designed based upon a honeycomb, looking at the structure of what a bee does. Well, then I looked at the wax. We use wax and beeswax to, you know, uh, for with our toilet seat, the seal around the toilet. When we put that, when we're mounting, we use wax for that. Um, we use wax to make impressions. And I got really interested in beeswax. It's non-toxic. How do we use beeswax to stabilize things, to hold things in place? And beeswax is removable. You take it and you can reply it and reshape it kind of thing. 
And that's when I discovered Lockliff Rug Gripper Tape because it looks like drywall tape, but it's all this mesh is embedded in this like beeswaxy material and it rolls up. And you can use that over and over and over again. And, and in schools, um, I talk about do no harm. Do not damage a school's wall. Do not damage a school's desk. Do not damage a, a student's wheelchair. Do not damage an iPad. So whatever we put on things has to be removed without leaving any residue behind. We're not allowed to put any nails in the walls. You can't put tape on the walls. But the lock lift rug gripper tape, because it's got this wax material that just grips in and holds th things in place. And again, it's non-toxic. So this is such an exciting and emerging field that um, I just brings me joy every day. And I love that. And your joy and passion shines through really easily. Um, do you feel that's... Um part of the occupational field as a profession? Do you feel that sense of joy and for, yeah, for future students like my daughter? <laughs> <laughs> you know, what's interesting. I am not an occupational therapist. I am the first non occupational therapist to ever be hired in the occupational therapy department. And the OT department said, you know, our students in the field of occupational therapy, they learn about crafts and they learn about splinting, but our students don't learn about all of these other materials and techniques. And so the University of New Hampshire hired me and um, to, to teach the assistive technology courses and to be the coordinator of the graduate certificate program in assistive technology, which has been going on now at the university for 17 years it's been at the university. And so um, so what's really cool about that is I am a really great example of that this is not a profession that is just owned by occupational therapy, that we are all called to solve problems and that we are all creative problem solvers. It's just figuring out how to tap into that creativity and where do you find the tools and materials. And the other part, so occupational therapists, the two things that I think about that is invaluable is they understand the body system and structures. So they understand when a, a particular disability, how far can somebody reach or what's their strength, right? So they understand strength, they understand range of motion, they understand where do you place things in front of someone. And so that's great. Um, speech and language pathologists, they understand communication, and how to program different systems. Physical therapists understand in terms of the body. Um, special educators and teachers understand the curriculum of what needs to be taught. And we need to work together as a team. We all have gifts and talents that we bring all together to solve those everyday challenges. About that message, I've often thought, uh, you know, the high school musical is one of the best experiences uh, of learning, I think, because it's it's all about a collaboration and using everybody's individual talents. And you come up with a great show at the end of it. So, yeah, <laughs> um, you've pretty much checked off most of the questions I had. But let me just dig into some. Uh, you mentioned, you know, teacher ed programs and how. Uh, you know, student teaching should be at the beginning rather than the end. I know we could probably spend another hour talking about this, but in a maybe a more concise answer, uh, how would you restructure some of the teacher ed programs? I'm, I'm curious. Um, I would restructure it. I think high school students need to, if they're interested in going into special ed, they should do um, like a one week job shadowing, um, a chance to really see what the challenges are in terms of um, day in and day out on um, in terms of being a teacher. And that that's just not, you know, to pursue a degree in, in, in special education, but any field, you know, I thought about my daughter is now in pharmacy. And when she was in high school, she spent um, a few days with a pharmacist at the hospital and was really intrigued. It just spoke to her and she was like, I want to be um, a pharmacist. I want to be a clinical pharmacist. So I think we need to provide more hands-on learning opportunities. 
um, students in high school and early college often they don't know what they want to you know they go in one direction and you look at how many people change their majors um, so that whole thing about experiential learning to really find out what what really hits your soul as to where where do you really see yourself fitting in We talked, uh, one of my questions was inspirations. And you talked about people that inspired you along the way, especially early on. Um, <clears throat> and I usually I usually kind of have the caveat when I ask this question to others saying, you know, besides your students, because I think we're all inspired by our students, you know, from teachers that I talk to. So I, I want to kind of preface that to kind of get them to, to pull in others. However, in your case, the inspiration that you get from the people, not really your students, but the people you help with the work you do, that's got to be rewarding. Is there an example of someone that maybe came to you and said, hey, this this really helped my situation and thank you. Do you, I imagine you get that a lot, but is there one that stands out? Well, I mean, you know, I, I think the one that stands out is... Um, I, I remember I was 23 years old. I had my mobile rehab engineering unit and I drive up on this farm and my nickname is Terry, T-E-R-R-Y. And this is before cell phones. And so you communicated mainly by letter. And I said, I'd be on the farm, you know, probably late morning. And uh, I drive up the farm. He had a John Deere 4030 tractor out and this farmer just lost his leg above his knee. And I was going to add a set of steps to the side of the tractor so he could get back up in the tractor. And I was going to put some hand controls um, so that he could um, operate the clutch on the tractor. So I drive up and I knock on the door and I say, um, hi, I'm Terry Wilcom. Is your dad around? And this boy who answers the door is looking at me really strangely and says, uh, yeah, just a minute. And you could hear him in the background, dad, Terry Wilcom's here and she had a guy, she's a girl. <laughs> and he comes to the door and I said, yeah, you got a John Deere 4030 tractor. Man, that tractor is going to last a long time. That's a really good tractor. I'm, I'm going to put some steps on and probably I, I should have that done by about three o'clock. Um, and I'll put some hand controls on for you. And his eyes got like really big, like this young girl knows how to weld. She's going to make these steps, right? And so he comes outside. And um, so I modified, you know, worked on the tractor and he gets in the tractor and his wife, you know, begins to cry. So this is the first time dad's back in the tractor again, right? Wow. And his son's there and he's just smiling ear to ear. And uh, he takes off with the tractor. He's now driving the tractor, right? And then um, he gets back and he opens up the door of the tractor and he looks at me and he says, I got a disc out back. Do you think you could weld that for me? <laughs> <laughs> and um, so that, you know, the, the thing about assistive technology is you see very, very quickly um, the difference that you make in somebody's life, right? You you see the outcome almost immediately when somebody can't do a task and now they can do because they have the assistive technology. You know, I think about um, inspiration, right? You know, like I think about Mother Teresa, right? And she talks about, you know, it's not how hard you work that's important. It's how much love you put into your work that's most important. And I often remember that, you know, about put all that love and joy into your work and the answers will come. Sometimes um, people will say, I I'm like, yeah, you can do that five minutes or less, $5. And then, you know, sometimes it takes longer to figure out a solution. Like, gee, how am I going to do this? How am I going to figure this out? And so that part about um, spending some time and listening and, oh, and failure, lots and lots and lots of failures. And people shouldn't be afraid of failing. That's part of the learning process. That's part of the problem solving process. And when I say you got a 95% chance of failing, I remember my students saying, well, then why should I even make it if I'm just going to fail? I said, because this is a three hour lab. That means you can fail 21 times, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, and try again and try again. And then um, another magical thing happened. 
Temple Grandin, you know, Temple Grandin and her work um, and Temple, you know, ha who has autism. And I won the lottery. Our names went into a hat. Who gets to have dinner with Temple Grandin? Because she came to the university and she was one of a distinguished lecture at the at the university uh, student union. And and so um, I had a wonderful time um, with her for dinner, but there was something, she gets on stage and she shows um, this origami thing, right? It was like a white sheet of paper and it had 144 lines in it. And then the next slide she shows is, is this beautiful swan. You fold it 144 times and you got this beautiful swan. But for whatever reason, something happened because um, I, after that lecture, I couldn't sleep. I was up all night because I started to look at, can we apply the origami principles to um, corrugated plastic to recycle election signs? What if I could put all those score lines and you could fold it this way, this way, in, out, boom, boom, and you could have a beautiful piece of assistive technology. So prior to having dinner with Temple Grandin and being inspired by her with her origami, I would have these kits and it would be a plastic bag and it would have 16 components inside this plastic bag and you would dump out the components and then you take this one and you'd peel the back and you'd put that down and you'd take this pole and you put that on. And I figured it out, figured out how I could make it as a continuous sheet of corrugated plastic, put all the score lines. Um, but what I would do is we'd get these huge sheets, four foot by eight foot sheets of corrugated plastic signs. And I laid them out on hospital gurneys <laughs> in the parking lot kind of thing. And I went from one end to the other, applied it all the tapes, put all the score lines in, then took an industrial paper cutter and went chunk, 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 and made up like 500 kits. No more plastic bags. Everything is all part of one board. Score lines on the top, score lines on the bottom. The tape has already been applied. The rubber has been applied. The Velcro hook and, and um, it made it easier and faster for teachers to be able to make the different devices. Um, it's saved on the environment. No more plastic bags kind of thing. So um, that was very, you know, inspirational on um, learning that. And that's a part about being open. And then, you know, you said earlier about, of course, we're all inspired by our students. Um, what I think is amazing is, you know, you have a freshman in college and they, we talk about spoon feeding. They're just sitting there, they're all nervous and they're taking notes, right? And they're trying to absorb all that information. By the time they get into their senior year or fifth year, man, they are challenging you on what you taught them. They're like, that's not how it really works in our field rotations. <laughs> and the biggest joy is when they take one of my inventions, one of my creations, and they make it better, right? Mm. And, and I'm like, whoa, I'm getting goosebumps, you guys. <laughs> this, is, this is so cool. And that is such an incredible gift when you see people who take your ideas and they make them better, right? Yeah, amazing. Well, wow. Usually my interviews are 20 minutes to a half an hour and, and it, it, this has just grown really fast and really wonderful. You've given me so much food for thought and you really are an inspirational person because of your passion and your, you're just willingness to just keep moving forward and keep trying new things. And, and your message about failure, I think is such a valuable one, especially for students who think, Oh, I, I didn't do well. And, and that sort of thing. And, um, we, we learn. So uh, let's just do our speed geek questions if you wouldn't mind. So these are just quick, short answers, and then I'll, I'll let you get back to your, your routine and, and creating amazing things. So we talked about, <clears throat> First of all, I forgot to ask you, usually the question I always ask is, are you a coffee drinker and do you have a favorite blend? Coffee, Starbucks. All right. Um, favorite yeah, blend? Pike Place. Pike Place. Okay. <laughs> all right. Good, good. Uh, what's your favorite app? Seeing AI. It's free. Microsoft came out with it, but it's really great for anybody with a print disability because it instantly scans a document and reads it out loud. I love wow, that app. So it's called Seeing? Seeing. S-E-E-I-N-G-A-I. 
It's my favorite. Yeah, yeah. yeah. See, yeah, Microsoft is doing a lot along those ways. I think. Yeah. A lot of innovation. Uh, what's your favorite way to unplug from technology? Hiking. Oh, I love being in the woods. Oh, Just nice. Yeah. New Hampshire's got great places. Oh, sure does. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I think maybe we've answered this, but what is, what's an educational trend that you're looking out for? You mentioned AI. Is that one of them or just what's your thought? Well, <clears throat> I'm really interested in Oculus because mm. some of the virtual reality things can really open the doors to many of our students with very significant and multiple disabilities. And so I'm really intrigued by that being getting better and better with virtual reality and how we can integrate that into um, the classroom, the home environment, the workplace. I think that's a, a future trend. Well, I'm glad you brought that up. And I was a little skeptical about VR. I thought, you know, it was going to be more of a consuming type of, of technology, but man, you are, you're right. And I think there's a, an explosion there ready to happen. I think even just in, you know, exercise science and, um, you know, uh, yeah, it, it really, it's, it's beyond just gaming and, and that sort of thing. I, I think there's great potential for that. So I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. And I think I agree. So, uh, Therese, Terry, <laughs> thank you so much for joining me. Uh, I'll make sure I have links to your books in the podcast and on the YouTube channel. Uh, keep up the great work and, and thank you for all you do. Thank you. This was fun. <laughs>